Please pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Kindle in us the fire of your love. And by that divine light, illuminate your holy word to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is part three of a sermon series I've been giving on Abraham. We were at Genesis 22, but we realized we had to branch out from there. The beginning of the chapter says, after these things, after all these things. And so we we went, wound it all the way back, rewound the tape, so to speak, to Genesis 1, pulled it back, and then started going through the whole faith journey of Abraham. 22 is the culmination of his whole journey of faith, which begins second half of chapter 11, more importantly, starting at chapter 12. That's where it really kicks in. And Abraham's faith and obedience are being tested to the max in chapter 22. He's had his trials before. We've broken all of those down and gone through them. And this is the ultimate test. This is the final one. I haven't put much focus on Isaac. We've been talking about Abraham. Isaac, obviously, is a very important figure here. Isaac, as a type, prefigures Jesus Christ. There are types. It's it's a kind of word. It's like archetype, stereotype, a type, which is used throughout the Bible. For instance, Isaac, I told you, is a type who prefigures Christ. But so is Joseph. You know, the younger brother that the other guys almost killed, and then he got taken off into Egypt, became an important person there. That Joseph, in many ways, prefigures Christ. In many ways, Moses prefigures Jesus Christ. You'll see these types throughout the Old Testament, and what you see in Jesus is the fulfillment of the type, finally. So Isaac prefigures Jesus Christ. Well, he's the son about to be sacrificed by the father. Well, that's pretty big right there. Notice that Isaac carries the wood up the hill. Sound familiar? The wood that he is going to be laid upon and sacrificed upon. Jesus carried the wood, his cross, the very thing he was going to be crucified on. He's the one who carried that up to the top of the hill. The age. A lot of artwork shows uh, uh, Isaac as as very young, maybe barely a teenager. Tradition doesn't see it that way, and there are other things beyond tradition. Just looking at the scriptures themselves would lead you to believe he's certainly not like 13, 14. He's older than that. Jewish tradition has a range of ages, anywhere from about 25 to as old as 37. So if you go right there in the middle, are you ahead of me? Are you with me? Right about the same age as Jesus when Jesus died on the cross. Now, I'm not telling you that's the way it was, but there is room for that. It makes one think. The age is important, too, because as you'll see, and I'll talk about it in other places, Isaac is is an adult. He's big. He's strong. If he was a kid, he wouldn't have been able to carry all that wood up to the top of the mount. He is compliant with what's going on here. He isn't some poor frightened little boy who doesn't know what's going on. He's adult, and he is very present to it. And this walk that they take together, you'll see the language it's used to underline that, makes it very clear. He is a party to this. Now, why is that important? Because of the relationship of our Almighty Father with His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. The place. He's off to the mountains of Moriah. Where are they? Right in and around Jerusalem. And I think many a scholar would agree that they believe that this mount where Isaac has been brought up to is in fact the same mount, Calvary, Golgotha, where Jesus himself was offered up. Three days from the moment that Abraham receives this news until he gets to the mount, it's three days. Some people look at that and and see that as a prefiguring of what happened with Jesus. What do I mean? The news that Isaac needs to be sacrificed in a figurative way 
at that moment, Isaac has died for Abraham. And what you see is dealing with the idea that he's dead for three days, you see the salvation as a kind of resurrection being acted out. Three days later, life is brought back to Isaac, who was presupposed to be dead. The relationship between Abraham and Isaac, so they went both of them together, which is what I was talking about. And this is said twice in it to underline it, lest you have any doubt. This very much prefigures the relationship between the Almighty Father and the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that is offered. It is part and parcel of their relationship. It, 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 it is, it is, it is um, affirmed uh, by both participants. It's not one dragging another along. Ridiculous, anyone who suggests such a thing. And you see that this is being underscored in the prefigured relationship between Abraham and Isaac as he's brought up. And finally, although it's not the only thing, you could go on about various things. You have the ram, which is discovered in the thicket. This is the lamb, the ram, that is being provided by God. That God the Father supplies the sacrifice for humanity that we can't possibly provide. God himself will supply the sacrifice that he needs. This is what's happening with Jesus Christ. And there is a notion here, and it's the first time in Scripture where it's said explicitly that the ram is being offered as a substitution for Isaac. It's a first explicit mention of substitutionary sacrifice. And that is very much who Jesus is, that he is a substitutionary sacrifice for all of us, that he takes on all the sins of the world, those sins which we couldn't possibly make up for. There's not enough sacrifice we could do to really find something that would be meaningful, just, and, and reconcile us to God. Only Jesus can do that. And so he substitutes for us in the sacrifice. The ram in the thicket is seen as Jesus. And the idea of the ram in the thicket, which is a lot of thorns, brings to mind Jesus who is crowned with thorns, ties him even that much more into this image of the ram in the thicket being taken out. Back to Abraham. I had mentioned before, no hesitation. But you see, my friends, this is chapter 2. He's had a long life of growing in faith. A lot of us may not be there, but don't despair. Continue in the process. You want to get to this place where there's no hesitation, regardless of the call. Sacrifice your son. I'm on it. You have said it. I have obeyed. My ears have heard it. My feet have moved. Getting up early in the morning, I mentioned to you, that shows, let's get to it. When you have something you want to do in the day, you want to get up early in the morning. Look at how kids are. They, well, they're waking up at 5 in the morning because they're going to go have the camping, they'll go fishing with Grandpa, and they're all excited, you know. It's interesting, he needs no reassurance. He needed to be reassured in chapter 21, is this what God wants? Here he needs none. This, again, is where you go as your faith matures. There's a certain security, a certain sense of surety you begin to develop. And notice, too, it must be said, and it often pointed out, that he says to the two young men who have accompanied them, we will return, we will be back, Isaac and me. Somewhere, somewhere in Abraham, in spite of the fact that the son is carrying the wood, that he's got fire in one hand and a knife in the other, and they're going up to the mountain, he says, we'll return. God and his ways. It says in the Old Testament, when God is talking to his people, my ways are not your ways. And the element of mystery. In every faith journey comes mystery. You must accept mystery. You must humbly accept that God is doing things that you don't quite understand. But that in due time, you may, not always, 
but you may begin to understand his ways. Part of why we have a tradition in our church, we do a thing called God Shots, where we share how God has been working in our lives. It's hard for me to, to underline how important this is for Christians and community to do this. We're all living lives of faith, and we all benefit from, from hearing how other people are working out their salvation, as Peter would say. What's happening? How does that work out? And so this is very important because it can be quite mysterious. The call that God has on you, may not understand. But by hearing other people's witnesses year after year, week after week, day after day, you begin to have the faith to follow as they did because they're telling you how these kind of asymmetrical things happened as a result of doing this thing that didn't make sense. But interestingly, after that, this happened. I knew a family who had been tithing. And a lot of people figure, oh, if you're tithe financially, good things will happen. <laughs> Not necessarily. It wasn't that they were suffering entirely, but there were no watershed financial year for them. But they continued to tithe faithfully. But what they said, interestingly, apart from their financial life, their life as a family and their relationship together just seemed to be getting better and better and better what one had to do to the other, I have no idea. But I know walking faithfully to God and with God opens you up to his blessings. Because it isn't that God's sitting up there waiting for you to do certain things before he drops a few coins from the gold coach that goes around the countryside waving to the peasants. It's not what's happening. God has so many blessings waiting for you that you don't receive because you're not open to them. If your arms are full of garbage, how can I give you these lovely gifts I have for you? There's no room. I, I, you can't receive them. You've got to let go of the garbage, you know? Only you don't think it's garbage. I did a lot of ministry with homeless people in New York City for several years and it is heartbreaking to see what some of them are holding on to in their shopping cart that they will not let go of. And, and because they will not let go of that, they won't go into the shelter and they're going to stay outside because they're not letting go of that shopping cart with all that stuff in it. That's this truth. True. I, I, I've seen guys who are the classic, what you would call winos, would rather stay outside in the freezing cold because if they went into the shelter, they'd have to give up their bottle. They're going to die over a bottle of night train. Now, I'm not going to let that go. They could be getting a warm place and a safe place and a really good shelter. Would not go. Got to have that. Got to hang on to it. It, it, it. It's not like God is sitting there withholding to you perform the tricks he wants. It's literally impossible for you to receive it because of things you're holding on to and won't do. And it won't do. His ways are mysterious. It's understandable why sometimes we have trouble going there. And that's why the witness in the congregation helps us. Say, geez, it worked out for Joey. I give it a shot. Let's see what happens, you know. One thing about mystery, I grew up Roman Catholic. Well, Roman Catholics sort of major in mystery. Mystery is like, yes, definitely, supernatural mystery. And I joke about it a little bit. When I was in seminary, I was in seminary with a lot of evangelicals. A lot of charismatics, too, but a lot of evangelicals. <laughs> they were really wary of Catholics and anything Anglo-Catholic. So be careful with them, you know. 
But I would say to them, I said, you know what your problem is sometimes among the evangelicals? You think you can nail everything down. Just get me that text. We're going to go through it. It's in the Word. We're going to get this figured out. We're going to exegete it to a fairly well. It's going to be awesome, and we'll know exactly what to do. And I said, you, you're fools. You know, <laughs> There's mystery. Any exegesis always hits a firewall of mystery. And, you know, and if you have the right attitude toward it, it's sort of delightful. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It's delightful to engage a God who is so much bigger than you or me that as far as we can understand him, we can understand everything. And, and to me, it's a relief. If I encountered a God who is perfectly explicable to me, that would be kind of scary. I love having a God that I get to a certain point, no matter how brilliant my exegesis is, no matter how genius the commentaries are I write, I hit a point of mystery. And people will say sometimes, better to focus on loving God than completely understanding Him. The loving Him works a lot better. On the other hand, I was quick to tell my evangelical friends that too many Roman Catholics play the mystery card too quick. When a kid has an interesting question, they say, well, that's, that's a supernatural mystery. Here we go. Let's go move on. You know, they could lose a little more evangelical exegesis, but that wouldn't make the world go round. Here I am several times. First time in the Bible I mentioned this before. Notice that Abraham says, here I am to God. He also says, here I am to his son. That's interesting. That to me is very interesting. The same kind of, of deference in a way or respect may be better. How respectfully he treats his son. That his son calls to him and he says, here I am. Just the same way he showed up to God, here I am. He's there to help and serve his son, even as he's there to help and serve God. It's a sign to us. This is the father of all fathers of faith, Abraham. And look at how he deals with his son. Here I am. Well worth noting. Chapter 12 through 22, you see these bookends. In 12, God says, go to Canaan. In 22, go to Moriah. That's how you tell, literally, tying it all together from here to here and you're seeing there the full maturity of Abraham's faith. This bookend at the end tying into the go to Canaan, go to Moriah is like pulls it all together and lets you know you've come to the fullness of it at this point. God does indeed test the faith of his people to determine the quality of their faithfulness. Some people don't buy that. They don't want to know that. Why would God be testing us? Because we need it. And it helps us. The Lord commands his people to make costly sacrifices seemingly unreasonable or impossible. How willing are they? This is what you begin to see in the Bible. He, he tests his people. They need to be tested. We need to be tested. We need to be tried. There are various kinds of ways of testing us and trying us. The faithful believer holds nothing back from the Lord, trusting that the Lord will provide. That's the big lesson that you see in Abraham's story. He is the model for us to follow. Leon Cass, in his writings, which I quoted a couple of times over the last previous two weeks, is talking about that. He's a new person. Abraham is the icon. Abraham is the paragon. Abraham is who we learn from and we're meant to copy, to imitate, to see what he did and then walk in his shoes, however that fits in our own lives. Sacrificial worship, that which we value the most. Sacrificial worship. To sacrifice. This is unusual for many, many people. I, I, I have to tell you that, especially... Living in North County, San Diego, I don't know how many people are living sacrificially, at least not the people I see in the immediate neighborhood. We sacrifice that which we value the most and rely on divine provision thereafter, knowing that 
we will receive divine approval and divine blessings. How do we know this? Here's Abraham. He's giving us an example bit by bit by bit. Watch. Abraham left his homeland. God gave him a new one. Abraham left his extended family. God gave him a much larger family. Abraham offered the best of the land to Lot. He split up with Lot because they had so much, so many herds, so many kids, so many people. They couldn't all be in one place. So they had to split up. And Lot looked at what seemed like the best and he said, I'll take that. And Abraham said, you go have it. God gave Abraham more land. Abraham gave up the king of Sodom's reward. God gave Abraham even more wealth. Abraham gave up Ishmael. But God made Ishmael the father of a multitude and only increased the great legacy of Abraham. Six, Abraham was willing to give up Isaac. God allowed him to live and through him gave Abraham numerous seed. Abraham is father of the nations. Remember the story of Abraham comes after the fall of the Tower of Babel. And what I've told you many times who've been in my church, you will see God's redeeming hand reworking things from the past. It happens with Jesus all the time in his story. He is redeeming one event after another. You can see in Abraham a redeeming of the fall of the Tower of Babel. What do I mean? At Babel, the world became dispersed, going in all different directions and creating all these disparate nations. Abraham becomes the uniting figure for all of humanity. I mentioned to you the other week, the three major Abrahamic faiths in the world make up a majority of people who uh, are attuned to a certain faith tradition, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, all have their foundation in Abraham. Abraham in chapter 22, you can see Judaism, Islam, Christianity. The Jews focus on the binding of Isaac. That's very often how they will title this particular chapter, the binding of Isaac. The idea of being bound and unbound is a huge aspect of the Jewish faith. We can't go into it all now. For the Christian, obviously, it's the Father supplying the sacrifice. Jesus is Isaac, only he's the lamb. Jesus is the ram that is replaced. That Jesus there. And so we see that. And and what Islam tunes into, as I mentioned the other week, is here I am, the great surrender. That's what Islam is about. And you see a redeeming of the fall of Babel by pulling all people together under God through Abraham. How wonderful. Fulfillment. Abraham to Jesus to Quinteto Angolano do Brasil. How did that work? (laughs) We are marching. That was a processional I picked today. I did not pick it accidentally or lightly. I picked it with tremendous intention. And I'll unfold it to you now. We have Abraham starting. And we have Jesus. And Jesus makes the big breakthrough in the Abrahamic faith. And saying it's not about flesh. It's not about being a blood descendant of Abraham. It's a spiritual connection to Abraham. That's what's important. This makes a huge difference. It opens up the Abrahamic faith to people who are not Jewish by birth. Because Jesus comes and fulfills it. And all are one in Jesus. There's neither Gentile nor Jew. There's neither master nor slave. Not Man nor woman. It keeps going down the list. All these distinctions, we are one in Christ. It cuts through all these boundaries and unites us in Jesus Christ. It's the exact opposite of identity politics. We just keep slicing everyone up and putting, it's like, no, 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 no. Jesus is the other way. 
And these distinctions that the world makes and makes very big deals out of get blown out of the water. That's what happens. How do I know? Well, look at this group. The Angolan Quintet from Brazil. That's what it means. How curious. And they're singing this song, We Are Marching in the Light of God. So you have Jesus Christ, who is this first century Jewish rabbi, who dies a criminal's death, he gets capital punishment, crucified on a cross. His Jewish disciples carry the message to a Gentile world, Greek and Roman, and they're received. And the Gentiles, as Paul say, become grafted on to Judaism, to the Abrahamic faith, and start to prosper and live. The faith continues to grow in this Roman Empire, which winds up reaching the shores of England, where there are Celts or Celts. And they begin to play with this religion and start getting involved. And they start carrying the message to Anglo-Saxons, who later come on. And eventually these Anglo-Saxons start going around the world carrying the faith to other places, including South Africa, including the Zulu nation. <laughs> and then you get this tune for We Are Marching in the Light of God, which is a traditional Zulu tune. They've been traveling a long way for this to happen. So now we've got this Zulu tune inspired by a religion from first century Jewish Middle East. And the song goes around. And everyone loves it. And you'll see Indonesians singing this song. And Chinese. And Americans. And school kids. And you name it. And you have a group in Brazil who are from Angola who are also Christians and they produce the presentation of the song that you saw in the processional. The slave trade to South America and Caribbean far exceeded, I mean far exceeded, any of the transatlantic slave to North America. It was huge. Went on for a long time. And Angola in particular has a very sad history of slavery. And they were brought over to Brazil and other places. With the Portuguese. And here we are in the 21st century and you saw those guys singing. You know they got it. And they're singing there with a young man who's playing the El Cajon who's obviously Brazilian, but definitely a Portuguese extraction and descent, playing together in Christian harmony. It's on an album called All for Christ, something like Tudo do Cristo, something like that. Are you getting it? These descendants from Angola, shall I go on? And all gathered around a traditional Zulu song inspired by ideas that English brought there. I mean, hello? This is what Abraham started. And this is what we are united by, this faith. He has so overturned the Tower of Babel and is being redeemed in this way in the body of Christ around the world. And it says we are marching. I'm so sorry to have to tell some of you there's a certain militaristic part of that because there is in fact a war going on. I don't know if you know that or not. And I don't know if you know right now in America Christian churches are being burnt, attacked, desecrated, satanic symbols put on them, worship services being interrupted, evil, rotten things being said, Christians being physically attacked, Sacred objects like certain statues being destroyed or desecrated. In case you didn't know. And this is nothing new for Christians. It might be new for American Christians. It's not new for Christians. It's always been a battle. Always been a battle. Always been a war going on. 
And we need to be inspired by the words of that song to march in the light. We're marching in the light of God. We're marching in the love of God. We're dancing in the love of God. We're dancing in the grace of God. That's what we're doing. It's God's kingdom versus the world. And it always has been. And it always will be. And once in a while it becomes very, very clear. And it happens to be one of those times right now. And we need to march in the light, not the darkness. The trials of Abraham progressed, one building upon the other in greater and greater difficulty. How about your trials? How are your trials going? How mature is your faith? What have you been asked to sacrifice? If someone said to you, I understand you have to sacrifice, Abraham, sacrifice. What have you sacrificed for yourself, for your for faith, would you say? Have you sacrificed a little or a lot? How much of a sacrifice was it? Have there been any burnt offerings? I talked about that last week. Like the whole thing goes. Completely. Totally. You don't get to keep a little bit. Jesus, God wants the whole thing. Ever happened to you? How'd that work out? You can gauge the depth of your faith and the closeness of your relationship to God by the trials you have faithfully endured. I don't know why I put two there. <laughs> endured to, lived through, whatever. I must tell you quickly, not every bad thing is a trial from God. I'm going to do a little breakdown for you. It will help. But you need to gauge the depth of your faith and the closeness of your relationship to God by the trials you have faithfully, faithfully endured. You need to look at that. You need to reflect on that. Because if there's not a lot there, you've got to wonder about it. I talked about that last week. If you're living an obedient, faithful life to God, you're going to experience hardship. There's no way around it. As I said the other week, you can't be in a football game and walk away with no black and blue marks. You haven't been in the game. Got to look at that. I said not every bad thing is necessarily from God. This is a breakdown I pretty much remember from Rick Warren. I think I'm using the words he did. I know I have the ideas right. He talked about different things, trouble, temptation, tribulation, trial. I may have a different order. Basically, I think I'm on point here. What is trouble? That's what you brought on yourself. <laughs> you, know, you didn't pay your income tax, and now you're facing an audit and this and that. It's like, oh, I guess God is trying me. He's testing me with an audit from IRS. <laughs> no, baby, you didn't pay your taxes. This is trouble of your own making. It's descending on, on you. What happens when you got trouble? You need to repent. That's the thing. That's what you do. Temptation. Sometimes people think they're being tested and they're being tempted, you know? So maybe some guy has a brand new secretary that they've appointed to him and she's beautiful and 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 he's feeling all kinds of feelings that he wish he didn't have, but he fools himself into thinking, well, uh, this is just a test God's giving me. <laughs> I need to continue to meet with her at lunch one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll do this, and I, I, it's like, no, 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 no. This is a temptation, and you will not have any one-on-one -on -one meetings with her, and you'll take other precautions to make sure you're okay. You know what I'm saying. So when you discern what's happening here, what's going on, it will tell you how to respond. Then he has another one, which is tribulation. Tribulation can be tough. Tribulation sometimes, I believe what he talked about, was when bad things are coming in that are the consequence of other people's sins. It's not yours. You know, you may have a spouse who secretly ran up all kinds of charges on a credit card, but you're married and your credit is linked and you're having to bear up under these tribulations. And what is your response? In part, one way or another, has to involve forgiveness. You need to forgive. That's what the call would be. So the, the, the reaction to temptation is flee, the reaction to trouble is repent. The reaction response to tribulation is forgive. 
If it's a true trial from God, it's to endure faithfully and to obey God. That's what you do. Are you being tested or tried? Are you being obedient unto God? Abraham, his testing and obedience go hand in hand. If you are obedient to God, I guarantee you, you're going to get tested. And if you're obedient through the test, your faith will grow and your relationship to God will deepen and broaden like you never believed. I'll wrap it up on a very human level. I've been told since I was a teen, and I'd often listen to older adults about different things, and they would say, when you're married, it's the hard times that draw you together the most. It's when a couple goes through a hard time together and stays together and grows together that their relationship deepens and broadens. And the tragedy is sometimes with certain couples, if stress comes in, the relationship is broken and they go their separate ways. But for couples who stay together and work through the troubles and trials together, they are rewarded with a deeper, more profound love than they ever had before and a deeper trust for one another than they'd ever experienced before. It helps deepen, broaden, enhance a relationship like nothing else. And so if we can understand that on that level, how much more might we be able to imagine this is true in our relationship to God? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.